This speaker is called uh, Sadhu Sundar Savaraj. Um, he is a major prophet of, of today. He sits on the Council of Abraham in heaven, actually. He has been walking with the Lord for about a half a century now. I think something like well, at least a few decades now. The Lord shows up and takes some places all over the place. He does missions for the Lord. Angels um, take him places. Um, he's got a very, very interesting, adventurous life. You never know when the Lord's going to show up. And um, he can see the angels. He can see the Lord when he comes, you know, when he's speaking. Um, he's had uh, many encounters with um, the cloud of witnesses, Moses, Job, Paul. John, Enoch, you name it, he's, he's been taught by them, he's been sit down and counseled by them, taught by them for hours and hours and hours, and um, so he's got a wealth of knowledge and he knows a whole lot about what's going on now and what's going to happen in the future, and he's been sent here to talk to us about um, how to prepare for what, 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 our, what we'll be doing in, in the future. Is a, it's a great remnant message. It's for everyone. But the remnant, remnant will really uh, grab a hold of um, what he has to say. And he shares his adventures also, too, throughout. Um, he's a very, very uh, godly man. And uh, so go ahead and get all the knowledge that you possibly can uh, out of it. Uh, um, he, let's see, his... Um, YouTube channel is called, um, what is it called? Angel TV. He's, he has Angel TV. He has the largest TV network in the world for uh, Christians. It's called Angel TV, and it's also on the World Wide Web, Angel TV. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come before your holy presence in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ this afternoon. Open our hearts, open our ears, that we may hear what the Spirit of the Lord is speaking to the churches and is speaking to this nation. In these last days, give us an understanding heart and give us a listening ear that we may hear what the Lord is speaking to us and the direction which he is showing to us. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Since the whole of yesterday, I do not know what was preached this morning, but yesterday you heard about myself and the other two speakers bringing words of judgment. And you will know that uh, when I ministered in the morning, the other two speakers were not there. But when they brought the messages, it all lined up. Like part one, part two, part three, like confirming one another. Am I right, everybody? It was like confirming and reconfirming what was spoken in the first message. And the one word that you keep on hearing continuously was of the judgment. And uh, yes, last night, as I was um, after. Uh, we went back to our hotel rooms, and as I was uh, waiting, I had a visitation from an angel of God who told me to wait at God at 10 a.m. the following morning. So, 
and uh, God would want to speak. So this morning at 10 a.m. I waited before God at the appointed time. And as I waited, I was caught up to heaven to participate at a council of prophets in heaven. You know, in heaven there are many, many councils. And among the one council, there is a council of the prophets. And this prophet's council chiefly is concerned or it oversees the last day's events that are going to take place on this earth. There are many, many gatherings in heaven. You know, the, the one thing that we are all most familiar with is a worship service in heaven. Most of us are only familiar with that because that's what we chiefly read in the book of Revelation. That everybody gather and they are worshipping God. So somehow we all have a wrong notion that in heaven everybody worships 24-7. Which is not true. Because there is worship that goes on in heaven continuously. And that is done by the angels. Certain classes of angels are created for that purpose. And they are in one secluded, one part of heaven. You know, the Bible says, in my father's house are many mansions. With a plural, right? And the, the Greek word for mansions is actually not mansions. The word mansions is not correct. It should be, Greek word is mone, M-O-N-E. And mone means realms. Realms of existence. So it's not a mansion like we would think a huge castle like Buckingham Palace. No, that's not the right translation. It is plains or places of existence. Like for example, you have Newcastle, I mean Castle Hill, you have Campbelltown, you have uh, Chatswood, you have this, you have Liverpool, Blackpool. You have Blackpool? No Blackpool, sorry. You know, Liverpool is a city in England. And there's also another city in England called Blackpool. So if you have Liverpool, I thought that you must have Blackpool. No Blackpool, all right. So like that, you know, suburbs where people live. Likewise, in heaven, there are these realms of existence or living. Or to make you feel a little comfortable, like, let's call it suburbs. There are different, different suburbs. And in one such realm is where... A class of angels specially created to worship God and fill the whole of heaven with praise. And their job or their created purpose is to continuously lift up praise all throughout. For lack of a better word, let's use the word day. Because in heaven there is no day, no night. So it's one complete eternity. So their job or Job, again, is not the right word. Created purpose is to worship and praise God all continually. Now, that is one place. But there is a time in heaven where all beings, created beings in heaven, together with all the redeemed saints, they all gather together to worship God. Like, for example, on a, your Sunday church service. Six days of a week, you go to work. Then on a Sunday, you gather, everybody gather to worship God. This you read in Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2, where the Bible says, there was a day when the sons of God all gathered before God. So that is called a general worship. And in Revelation, you read about that continually in chapter 7, where all the angels and all the redeemed saints, together with the 24 elders, they all worshipped God. So there is a special time where a worship, general worship service takes place in heaven. But besides all this, there are so many other activities that take place in heaven. If you read the book of Revelation very carefully, you will find a lot of activities that on going in one place of heaven. If you read chapter 8, you'll 
find the angels bringing bowls of prayer before God. So if they are worshipping God all 24-7, so where do they have time to bring bowls of prayer? And then in chapter 5 you'll read, the 24 elders received the bowls of prayer and they offered before God. So if the 24 elders are also engaged in worshipping all 24 hours, so where do they find the time to receive these bowls of prayer to offer unto God? And then you'll read in Revelation chapter 12, that the angels, Michael and his angels, are engaged in war. If Michael and his angels are also involved in worship all 24 hours, where are they going to find time to go and fight war? So, there are so many activities take place all the time. And then in chapter 15 you read that there were seven special angels appointed to pour the wrath of God upon the whole earth. And then in chapter 8 and chapter 9 you read Seven angels blowing trumpets upon the world. So if all the angels and all the beings are involved in just worshipping God all the time, then where do all these angels find other times to do all these other works? So let's establish once and for all this correct understanding that heaven is a place where there is a myriad of activities. Different, different activities that take place all the time. Among all the activities, there is one activity at a certain appointed time where all the beings, you know, even some beings from other planets, other worlds created by God, they all come, congregate to worship God. Besides that, we have all these other things. Now, there is a council in heaven. You read of this in the Bible. Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 18. It says, For who among them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see and to hear his word? Or who has paid attention to his word and listened? So there you have one scripture. So before I share with you what I was shown, I want to just give you some scriptural proofs for such uh, encounters and experience so that our faith is not built on some subjectivity but solidly objectively on the word of God and in Isaiah chapter 42 verse 9 behold the former things have come to pass and new things I now declare before they spring forth I tell you of them. To whom is God saying? He's not saying to everybody. That scripture is followed or linked together with Amos chapter 3 verse 7. For the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets. The prophets here do not necessarily mean the prophets on this earth, but the prophet saints who are also in heaven. If you read Revelation chapter 1, you'll read that when God, the Lord Jesus, spoke to the prophet John, or the apostle John, the Bible says, He sent His angel to communicate to John the things that are to come. But then, you'll read in chapter 19 and chapter 22, that this angel is really not an angel. Especially if you read Revelation chapter 22 verse 8 and 9. He's not really an angel because when John fell down at the feet of the angel to worship him, the angel will say to him, don't do that. You should only worship God. I am your fellow brother and of the prophets. No, no angel will come up to you and say, I am your brother or I am your sister. Angels cannot say that because they are created by God as ministering spirits. They don't have the spirit or they are not created in the image of God. So the angels will never come up to you and say, Hello brother. If any angel, if, if you ever had an encounter with an angel comes and say, Hello bro. Number one, it means one of two things. 
Number one, he is not an angel, he may be a saint of God. Number two, he is not an angel at all. Somebody real who come up to say, Hello brother. <laughs> so please remember this. So when this angel told John, I am your brother and your fellow prophet. So that confirms the identity of who this angel is. He is none other than a prophet of a bygone era. So the prophets are in heaven and God reveals his secrets first to this council. He gathers all these prophets together unto him and he tells them, this is what I intend to do. What do you all think about it? He first reveals his secrets to them. And uh, then, after getting a consensus, their opinions and all that, and of course God doesn't need to ask for the opinion. You know, you have an example there in Genesis chapter 18. The Lord had already decided to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But he said, let me discuss this over with Abraham. This is what I'm going to do. What do you think about it? And then they gave an opportunity. You know, when God comes and shows us something, it is not for us to triumph over or gloat over what God has said. Most of the time, we we should do exactly like what Abraham did to intercede. That is the purpose God is giving us revelation. One is to communicate and the other is to intercede. And the other scriptural example I want to show you is 1 Kings chapter 22 verses 19 to 23. And Micaiah said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the hosts of heaven standing beside him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? See, look at verse 19. The, all the hosts of heaven standing beside him on the right hand, on the left hand and the Lord asks them a question. Who will do this or who will do that? You read of a similar thing in Isaiah chapter 6 where the Lord asks, who shall go on my behalf? See, if now you, you just imagine in your mind like this. If Isaiah was the only one standing there and he saw the vision. Why must God ask who will go on my behalf? Right? The question would have been, will you go on my behalf? Am I right everybody? Grammatically, that's how it should be. But for God to say, who will go on my behalf? It simply means Isaiah was not the only one standing there. In a crowd like this, Isaiah was just one among them. And then the Lord looked around and said, Who will go on my behalf? And maybe several hands went up or several hands didn't go. Only Isaiah's hand went up. So this is another scene where the Lord discusses his plans with the before the council, before doing anything on the earth. So this being your scriptural background, now let me share with you what happened this morning. So this morning at 10 o'clock, I was brought before this council where there are about 7 or 8 prophets, ancient prophets. And the chairman of this council is none other than Abraham himself. And there is there's, uh, Moses in the council, Jeremiah, Elijah, the Apostle Paul, and those ancient ones. And uh, I have been in this council many, many times. It, it has been my merciful grace privilege granted by God to be at the council. So this morning when I was there, the discussion was about Australia. 
that was the discussion and that was the purpose I was called to witness what is what is being discussed and then to come and share with you this is one of the core that God gave me several years ago he said as a prophet not only you will hear but you will participate in the council in heaven and hear what is being spoken and then communicate to the people I first saw this before I was officially given this call you know we have our dear Pastor Elizabeth in our midst uh, do you all know Pastor Elizabeth let's give a good clap to Pastor Elizabeth she is one of the pioneer ministers in this city who has labored very much for the Lord and God has given her wonderful anointing for deliverances and uh, she has pioneered Indonesian church and does even in her very young age today she goes about doing a great work for the Lord Selamat datang and she is a precious woman of God I remember I think the first or the second time when I came to Australia she, her, she and her church was part of the committee and uh, I, I cannot remember it was whether it was the beginning of the convention or the post of the con conference when the committee was all praying together and uh, they were all praying for one another as I was closing my eyes in prayer I saw heavens open and that was the first time I saw the council but at that time I was not in the council I was just a spectator and when I saw the council they were hearing the prayer that was being prayed on this earth and then one of the same day he said look at Elizabeth's face and uh, everybody were closing their eyes and they were praying you know and uh, when I opened my eyes I saw her there was light a glow shining on her face and then the word of the Lord came for her concerning at the time she was going to do you remember this do you remember yes she was going to build a church construct a church and she was going to real hell warfare and that word from the Lord really boosted her that day to keep on going on the project so that was the first time that I saw in, in the council but now sitting there participating in the council on a, everyone sits around the table like a round table conference table and there was a huge map of Australia on the table and the Saint Abraham took something like a pen or I don't know what it was he drew a line straight from the northernmost part of the land down to the southernmost part and then he drew another line across so like the country was divided into four parts you know right at the intersection where two lines meet two angels were stationed there they appeared and then the angels who were there in the country they were now presenting their report before the council if you read Genesis chapter 18 two angels accompanied God to pronounce judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah and God came and told Abraham I will now go in see according to the things that my ears have heard concerning what is coming out of Sodom and Gomorrah and then the two angels were sent forth to go and see and report to God whether the cup is become full according to all the voices they are hearing coming from the land and whether they sh a judgment should be pronounced so two angels went forth and yesterday you heard brother Neville sharing that the same angels that went to Sodom and Gomorrah they were sent to Sydney to spy the land so 
Now this is the report. Those two angels submitted before the council. Sydney, much sinful activity has been recorded. So they write down in their on their iPads. Hey, do you think only you have iPad? They have a better iPad. That Apple will never keep on changing. Version 2, version 3, version 4. No iPhone 7, 8, 9, 10. No. Only one standard that lasts us for eternity. Amen. Okay. Now this is what they reported. I'm going to read to you exactly as how I heard in the council. Things they do in the night are so awful to be mentioned. Dogs are brought into gay clubs by women and sexual acts are committed. Men too commit these acts. So much sexual perversion takes place in the city that makes Sodom and Gomorrah pale in comparison. The two angels who visited Sodom and Gomorrah testified in the council. When we visited Sodom and Gomorrah, only men were engaged in gross sexual acts. You read that in Genesis chapter 19 verses 4 and 5. But here in this city, it is women with women, mankind with animals, parents with children, and some grandparents with their grandchildren. These parents engage in sexual perversion with their children as if they were husbands and wives. Is it true? To the best of your knowledge? We saw babies strangled and killed. Some in the name of medical science and some with violent brutality. They were even fed to the animals. Such things also takes place in India. Some hospitals who perform illegal abortions, they don't report them. They just throw those uh, fetuses. Some of the fetuses are not, they are really formed. And they are thrown out on the dumpster where dogs all gather and the dogs eat those fleshes. And how do we know all this? Because there was an incident where it was reported to the, some public saw that that the animals were, the dogs were eating some kind of a tissue and it looked like a small little baby. And the public reported to the police and they came, they found the whole area filled with baby bones. And then when they raided the hospital, they found that illegal abortions were done in the hospital. So, when this was reported, suddenly, one saint stood up with a righteous fire in his eyes. Elijah stood up and he asked a question. What is the church doing about it? With all this that's going on, what is the church doing about it? And the angels reported this. They are sleeping and engaging in similar activities. They are drunk with the wine of Jezebel and are engaged in such similar perversion. You read this in Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 and chapter 17 and the verse 2. We have been sent, now these angels are saying, we have been sent to remove several of their churches of their lampstands. Those churches that have been not walking right with God, before God, their lampstands removed. And in the natural, 
the churches will just close up or the numbers just dwindle and dwindle one member leaves another member leaves it in the natural it appears the members are leaving or for greener pastures or they are moving to another city for a work or for whatever reason it is not that is not the real reason the real reason is spiritually the church lampstand has been removed once the lampstand has been removed there is no more life coming out of the church when there's no more life coming out of the church the church will wither and die let me give you one example in genesis chapter 2 you will read that when god made adam and eve he also made a lot of fruit bearing trees and he told adam all the fruits that you see in this garden you can eat them except the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil and adam kept on eating the fruit from the tree of life you know from genesis chapter 2 to chapter 3 what is the period of time we are looking at we don't know it seems like it happened the following day it cannot happen the following day i once read of a saintly woman from the 12th century she was blessed by god to see visions of the whole bible and in this vision she saw now this is debatable but it sounds logical to me that the events the time that adam and eve spent in eden before they sinned was a period of 7 years it was only after then chapter 3 begins so that sounded logical to me because it cannot have been overnight where eve goes shopping like what most women do today and as she was shopping from tree to tree she saw this tree and there was a beautiful fruit on the tree and a serpent comes up and starts talking to you you know if you walk down a mall today and a serpent comes up to you or a dog comes up to you and talks to you what will you do say hey hey talky you're talking to me would that be your reaction or you will jump out of fright you will jump out of fright won't you that would be our natural human reaction but let's suppose every day you keep on hearing the dog talking to you then it will become a second nature dogs talking to you or animals talking to you and you will not find it a strange thing for an animal to talk to you this is what happened in the garden of eden eve was regularly hearing animals talking to her remember what brother nevel shared yesterday if you walk in true love of god the, you can hear animals or the creation talking to you and they were talking every day so on one fine day when the serpent came up and spoke to her it was not something strange for her to hear the serpent talking to her so she responded naturally like she had always done little realizing that the serpent on that day has been anointed with the baptism of the satanic spirit that's the difference you know previously the satan serpent was just a ordinary god created serpent but that particular day something else had entered into it and he didn't know so she got deceived in the same manner we read here when the church is so adam and eve they sin and they were cast out of the garden of eden adam and eve started dying because they stopped eating the fruit from the tree of life that's when they started dying just like if you stop eating you will die in the same manner the moment they were prevented from eating the fruit from the tree of life they could no more live forever and if you read genesis chapter 3 very carefully god says lest they put forth their hand and 
partake the fruit from the tree of life and live forever in their sin. Therefore God put a cherubim and a flaming sword of fire that will protect the tree of life from being eaten by Adam and Eve. So they were prevented from eating and they slowly began to wither and die. And it took them 930 years for the tree of Adam to wither and die slowly. So that's what happens. No church instantly dries up. It slowly withers and dries up. Eventually, it is close. And when it's close, you will know that the lampstand has been removed. That's why it is close. That's why there's no more life in the church. It's just dead. No life because the lampstand has been removed. Or a minister of God or a believer of God who once were mightily anointed by God. Now they just look ordinary. Why? Lampstand has been removed. Some of their ministers have been judged and turned over into the hands of the enemy. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 3 to 5, you will read how the apostle Paul was taken in the spirit to the Corinthian church and he saw the believers sinning in secret and he committed them into the hands of Satan for the destruction of their flesh so that their soul can live, so their soul can be saved. So which means once a person is turned over into the hands of Satan for the destruction of the flesh, then Satan has all the rights to inflict you with all kinds of diseases and infirmity and afflictions just like you read in Job chapter 1. It was Satan who put the sickness and the boils on Job. God did not. So, when, when your flesh is turned over into the hands of the devil for destruction, no medicines can heal you. No. Because you have been judged. Your pain will never be relieved. It will never be elevated. You will be screaming and crying in pain all the days of your life. And no medicines will ever work on you. Not even prayer. That is the worst part. Because 1 John chapter 5 verses 15 to 17 says, There are some sins unto death and we cannot pray for that. There have been several circumstances where the Lord has prevented me from praying for a person's sickness. He said, don't pray for their sickness. Pray that their soul, the sins of their soul will be forgiven them so that they will be safe. But they have been turned over for the devil to be destroyed. You know, the most heartbreaking experience I have ever had so far was I was called to pray for a 24 year old young handsome looking Nepali boy in Sikkim. This boy was dying of AIDS and he didn't know that. He didn't know that. His parents knew. They didn't tell him. The doctors have just numbered his days. And when I was asked to pray for this boy, the mother pleaded with me, please don't ever tell my son that he has AIDS. And not just beginning stage, no? terminally ill. And uh, when I went to the hospital bed, I looked at this boy, handsome looking young man. Young boy, 24 years old, full of life, vitality, a great future ahead of him. And I was so heartbroken when I saw this young man. And I asked the Lord, Lord, why? Why did this come upon him? And the Lord showed me his whole life. He was a great womanizer. From the age of 16, he started womanizing and raping in the form of sexual fantasies 
all the girls in his college. Every girl that he sees on the street will just pick them up like this and sleep with them and then throw them away. That that he sees past time. And the Lord said, This is the judgment that has been pronounced over him. His boys are from a Christian family. So the Lord told me, Don't pray for his healing. He has been judged. But pray that his sins will be forgiven him so that his soul will be safe. And I pray with great broken heart for that boy. And after a period of time of praying, I had the assurance that God has heard my prayer. And the Lord showed me how long he will live. When I came out of the hospital bed, my secretary was there. I told her, okay, this is the length of time this boy is going to be alive. I said, you can tell the mother or don't tell the mother. It's up to you. And sure enough, that boy wouldn't live for that long. And he died. And there was another time, many years ago, when I was in Sydney, I was taken to pray for another early 20s young man who was also dying of AIDS. He was skin and bones. He, when I met him, he cried and he cried like a little boy. And he confessed to me all the sins that he has done. And he was at the last stage of dying of AIDS. And he even he confessed all his sexual sins. So again I prayed for him. For the forgiveness of his sins. So that the soul will be saved. The flesh has been turned over into the hands of the devil for destruction. Why does God do that? If you read Isaiah chapter 48 verse 14. God throws you on the pit of affliction to save the soul. Sometimes, you know, the sicknesses are permitted to save the soul. If you are not, let's say, for example, put a break on your walk, or like a comma, if you continue down the road, you will eventually even lose your salvation and you will end up in hell. So God, out of His great love and mercy, permits you to be put on the bit of affliction so to save your soul. Once I was called to pray for a church pastor, a woman pastor in San Francisco who had cancer. The cancer was found in her liver and in a short time it spread all over her body and the cancer came on her neck and she was bent down she could not sit up, she could not lie down all over her entire, every organ in her body there was cancer and I know this church very well and they have very high respect for me so they asked me to come and pray for her so I went there and I fasted for 7 days and the Lord showed me her life what the wrongs that she did and because of the wrongs she has done which are irreparable if she was healed she will continue to do that so the Lord allowed this to heal her to restore her back to himself and the Lord told me now you tell her all this and tell her to repent of all these sins so that her soul will be saved so one morning, when everybody, her husband and all the people in the house had left for work, I went to her. And by then, she was lying on the sick bed for six months, immobile. Western medicine failed. Chinese traditional medicine failed. All kinds of medicines failed. They did not even make a dent on her cancer. It was spreading like a wildfire. So, that morning, very thankfully, I shared with her all the things the Lord showed me and she cried and she cried and she cried terribly. And then, when she consoled herself, she told me, 
whatever you just said to me is a confirmation to what the Holy Spirit has convicted me for the last six months. This, on her sick bed, the Lord, Holy Spirit has been convicting her of all these things. So I let her through prayer. I said, okay, now, I told her openly, I said, you will die. You will not rise up from this sick bed. You will die, but you will be safe. Your soul will be safe. You will not go to hell. You will be in heaven. And she was satisfied with that. She said, okay. And after prayer, there came a glow of light on her face. And shortly after that, she died. But her last remaining days were the happiest day of her life, knowing that her sins have been forgiven her. So these are some of the cases where people have been turned over into the hands of Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And the angel continued, Some have been judged by our Lord and kept in prison. Which means you will not even stand before God on the great white throne judgment day. Your sins have gone beyond the judgment day. You have already been judged. And there is a scriptural reference for that in 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 24. Now, these are how a city is been seen. Now next, Abraham then spoke to me, or he spoke to the whole council. He said, what is now going to happen next? Okay, this is your present, your past and your present. This is how you stand. Now what's next? A fire is going to come upon this nation. When he spoke this word, I saw a vision of a flame, a huge flame of fire, which looked like a burning meteor. But it's not a meteor. It was a flame of fire. It came down from heaven. And as it reached the airspace over Australia, it split in two, like two flames of fire. And it came down. And this is what they said is going to happen. One will fall upon the city, meaning Sydney, to consume it in judgment. The other will fall upon the churches to purify and sanctify it. The Lord has some kept themselves and you are walking in white. Now a warning. A spiritual perversion is coming upon the whole land that will divide the true believers from the false believers. The true believers concerning their nation, concerning the nation of Singapore, as a result of the covenant made, God remembers. Even in judgment, He remembers mercy. He remembers the covenant that they had made. So I told the people, now go back. And I saw clearly the picture of the church where it took place. It stretched out the, the arch of the, the rainbow, stretched all the way back to the central part of the country in 1950s. And a church there was where these godly men and women gathered together. They fasted and they prayed and they made a covenant with God. So likewise, there were also covenants like these that have been made in the land. True men and women of God in your country. And I'm sure they're happy. Am I right everybody? There, there will always be a remnant for God from time to time. You know, the, forget about the masses. There will always be a remnant who really take hold of God. And because of the remnant, God's eyes will be upon the future generations. Because of the covenant the remnant made. Several years ago, I was in one particular city, I think in Michigan in the US. And the Lord showed me 
the vision. In the vision I saw, the first president of the U.S., George Washington, he was kneeling down like this. And he put his hand and he prayed. And tears rolled down his eyes and he fell on the ground. And the Lord scooped those sand. Those tears filled wet sand. He scooped them up and he took it to heaven. And those sands are there and the tears of Judge Washington, they speak and they intercede before God's throne for U.S. all the time. And I described to the people the vision that I saw. And later on, someone came and brought a postcard of Judge Washington in prayer and said, Is this how you saw? And that's exactly how I saw Judge Washington in prayer. See, the covenant that was made by the forefathers of the nation. They don't go down the tree. God does not forget the covenant. That is why the many times when God wanted to destroy Israel, if you look at the prayers that the prophet Moses prayed, he always said, Lord, remember the covenant you made with Abraham. You remember that? In Exodus chapter 32, he prayed like they said, remember, remember the covenant you made with Abraham. Remember that. Because of the covenant that God made with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, Israel is alive till today. The covenant that God made with a one man 5,000 years ago, a small tiny island, as sinful as she is today. You know, Israel, among all the nations of the world, is the gay capital of the world. The gay capital. And Israel is the number one nation ratio-wise for abortions. She is the number one nation in the world. Abortion and gayism. That is why the Bible says in Revelation chapter 11, she is called Sodom and Gomorrah. Jerusalem is called Sodom and Gomorrah. For all this, she is still spared by God. God still fights on her behalf, protects her till today from the Hamas, from the Palestinians, from the threat of Iran, from the threat of everybody because of the covenant he made with Abraham. Likewise, there are covenants made in this land by your godly spiritual forefathers. And the prophecy spoken over this land. And when Smith Wigglesworth visited this land, he not only prophesied, he also prayed for this land. The tears that rolled down his eyes and fell on the ground, those tears are carefully kept before God. Right? The Bible says, no, your, your tears are collected and kept before God. So you need to gather all of them, find all of them and pray. Finally, a revival of pure fire will break out in this nation. Then two great wings of an eagle will be given to this nation to spread the revival all over the world. Amen. This is the word of the Lord.